So what happens after I get pregnant? Well, I'm speaking, of course, from the perspective of a woman, a female. I cannot get pregnant. But what happens after I get pregnant? So let's talk about a few of the things. So the act of copulation has been successful in that it led to fertilization. The acrosome reaction, the cortical reaction, one successful sperm has contributed 23 chromosomes to match with the 23 chromosomes uh, in the egg to produce a brand new human. So in the beginning, that's just one cell. So these two cells combined, they, performed, they formed one cell, which is called the zygote in the beginning. And that zygote's going to divide through mitosis, turn into two cells, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, then 64, then 128, then 256, so on and so forth, until it becomes a ball of cells and eventually the, the the ball of cells at the beginning these are all kind of, they're all identical pretty much uh, they are undifferentiated but they have the potential to turn into many different types and when these cells start to organize and move around and some of them start to move towards one center they you start to feel like they're going to become destined to become particular types of cells. So uh, there's a few stages here. In the beginning, when it turns into just a solid ball of cells, this is called the morula. So you've got zygote turning into the morula. This is called the cleavage division. It kind of looks like it's being cleaved. I don't know. What an inappropriate term. Cleavage division. But eventually you get a, a, a group of cells called a morula. That's a solid ball of cells. Eventually, when the cells start to, like I said, move towards specific areas, to move towards the outside and start to create a space inside, we call it a blastocyst, a blastocyst. So you have to know that those are the various stages. You can break it down a little bit further. There's another stage called the gastrula, gastrula. Oh my gosh, it's hard to say, gastrula. Anyways, continuing on. Uh, blastocyst is the level that we have to understand. It's a hollow ball of cells. And when it's at this stage, that's when it's looking for a place to go and it's trying to uh, find a nice little bed to lay down. And the uterine lining is a wonderful place. It's already got plenty of blood vessels, uh, capillaries with instant hookups to oxygen and a steady source of carbohydrates. So glucose can be hooked up through there. Uh, implants in the endometrium, that's another name for the uterine wall. It's going to grow in there, uh, producing villi, and, and in this case, it's kind of like a mini parasite, even though it's your lovely future kid. The body, the, the mother's body, actually still kind of uh, recognizes it, or doesn't recognize it, and thinks it's something foreign. So this little blastocyst is going to lay down into the uterine wall. It's going to grow villi and absorb nutrients from the blood vessels and hookups. And eventually it's going to grow a placenta, a very uh, complex structure, which you might have seen in one of the other videos already. Uh, the placenta tissue actually grows from the fetus, which is really neat. So it takes approximately one week from fertilization uh, to actually implant in the uterine wall. A couple things have to happen here. Remember, the hormones that are important for maintaining the, the uterine wall are estrogen and progesterone. If you remember the word FELP, F-E-L-P, those are four hormones, FSH, estrogen, luteinizing hormone, and progesterone. Remember, at the end of the menstrual cycle, progesterone usually drops and then the uterine wall breaks down. But if you want to stay, keep that uh, keep that blastocyst implanted in the uterine wall, you need to keep this uterine wall there. You, will, you don't want progesterone levels to drop, so you have to maintain the uterine lining, so you need estrogen and progesterone. These hormones are provided by the corpus luteum, which are the, it's the follicle cells. After they released the ovum, they kind of degrade and turn into this yellow body. That's what corpus luteum means. And the corpus luteum continues to secrete uh, progesterone and some of these hormones. Then if the corpus luteum disappears, then you have nothing to actually provide progesterone and the uterine wall dies. So we need another message here. And then uh, here's where the embryo or that, that, we had the, morula, the ball of cells, the embryo, which is just a group of cells. We, in this case, we call it the blastocyst, but it can be in more advanced stages as well. The embryo secretes a message, a hormone called HCG. It's called human chorionic gonadotropin. And this is actually what is detected in pregnancy tests. So when somebody buys a pregnancy test 
from the pharmacy and tries to uh, check for it by urinating on the stick, the stick is actually testing for the presence of HCG. If HCG is there, then 99% chance that it's, there's, a, there's an embryo there that's, that's actually producing the higher levels of these things. But you could get false readings. But this is important. HCG is important because it keeps the corpus luteum intact. If the corpus luteum is intact, then we continue to get progesterone. If progesterone is there, then we keep our uterine lining and we keep our bed. If one of these things drops out, the uterine wall breaks down and there's no more place for the embryo to hold on to and then we have a, a miscarriage okay a miscarriage which is not a happy thing um yeah other things the amniotic sac you've heard about this before a lot of people get the amniotic sac confused with the placenta so be careful the amniotic sac is just something that surrounds the fetus it's filled with amniotic fluid uh, we can actually do a test called amniocentesis to actually get samples of the baby's chromosomes to find out about uh, the health, the genetic health of the baby. It shouldn't leak, it should protect from infection, and uh, it acts as a shock absorber. But still, you don't see pregnant women running around, running around wrestling with each other and everything like that. Um, the placenta is addressed in another one of the videos, but the key thing here is it is tissue that belongs to the fetus and it grows, it grows, sorry, it invades the maternal uterine tissue and it's a really complex structure that allows things to be exchanged between the mother and the baby. In other words, for waste materials to go from the, from the baby, from the fetus to the mother and for nutrients and, and oxygen to come. Uh, from the mother, but this is addressed in a lot more detail in other placental videos, so please check those out. Um, yeah, you'll get this in more detail in one of the other videos, but the blood doesn't mix, which is kind of cool. That's why moms and their babies can have different blood types, and if you understand how blood types work, then um, it makes sense that the blood cannot mix. Amniocentesis, I talked about this earlier. It's one way uh, you can actually, the amniotic fluid actually contains the baby's cells in there, so you can actually uh, check to see uh, the number of chromosomes, doing a karyotype, K-A-R-Y-O-T-Y-P-E, to find out if there are uh, any genetic issues. Down syndrome is one that is commonly identified using amniocentesis. Finally, you're ready for the world. You're ready to come say hello to everybody. You've been causing a lot of trouble for nine months, and uh, this is basically what happens. Um, after 38 weeks, the fetus will send signals to the amni amniotic sac, and you start secreting a chemical called prostaglandins. These prostaglandins will start to initiate contractions of the uterine wall. This is an example of positive feedback. It's one of the easiest examples of positive feedback to understand in biology normally it's all about negative feedback homeostasis is all about negative feedback mechanisms negative feedback means the outcome of something will serve to have the opposite effect of whatever process it was that caused that outcome uh, for example your body temperature so if your body temperature is too high well that's going to signal something back to help to reduce your body temperature by uh, various steps um, to help you cool down basically but in this case this is an example of positive feedback and that's going to help to basically expel the, the baby from the body so the contractions push the baby's head against the cervix causing dilation and when the baby's head is pushing against the cervix and that's what the doctor's looking at when he says or when she says um, five centimeters dilated or ten centimeters dilated it's how open the cervix appears when the baby's head is pushing against. The nerve endings as a result of the baby's head pushing against that cause the pituitary gland to release a hormone called oxytocin. which is a very famous hormone. It's involved in many other things as well. Oxytocin and prostaglandins cause contractions to be longer and stronger. So the more the baby's head pushes against the cervix causing dilation, the more this oxytocin rele is released, the more oxytocin is released, that causes the contractions to be longer and stronger. Now that's a good thing because that's going to help to actually push the baby out of the body. Okay? 
you can tell that after the baby has left the body, you won't have these kind of pushes anymore, and then all of a sudden, you're going to end up uh, with no more contractions, which makes sense because after the baby is out, you don't need the uterine wall to be contracting anymore. And finally, it's called expulsion. And you heard of labor, okay, when a woman goes into labor. Uh, first stage is called labor, second stage is called expulsion. Powerful contractions push the baby out. Since there's no more pushing, that positive feedback loop is broken and then the contractions pretty much reduce. This is something you don't see in movies very often. At the very end, after the beautiful baby is out and the mother's holding the baby and the father's passed out on the floor and everyone's crying and taking pictures, cigars, and everybody's happy, you never see this part, but this does happen. The placenta is expelled as well. And the placenta is foreign tissue. It belonged to the fetus. It's at the other end of the umbilical cord. So here comes the baby, umbilical cord attached. At the other end, if you keep on pulling, eventually the uterine contractions will continue to push out the placenta as well. Hold on one second. It will push out the placenta and then everything will be over and done. Phew! Actually, you do continue That's to it. Have